that itself that it itself be made a permanent body with the additional mandate of overseeing and enforcing the implementation of the recommendations. A situation where one of the two parties, the central government, also acts as interpreter and adjudicator is simply not acceptable to us. The second issue which I wish to raise is the enormous dysfunctionality in the constitutional scheme of things which has been brought in over the years on account of unabated expansion of centrally sponsored schemes by whatever the name, additional central assistance scheme or central assistance to the state plan, etc. Such schemes now have fund allocations which run into over 2 lakh crores. Many of these schemes are implemented, implemented through apparatus outside the state budget which obfuscates responsibilities. To see the issue in perspective, we have to begin with the distinction we have artificially created, perhaps uniquely, between plan and non-plan expenditure. Firstly, it prevents badly required expenditure on non-plan items, such as police and transport, because everybody is competing to show a larger plan size. Secondly, it has given the central government an instrument for preempting flow of funds from the central pool of taxes to the state. The burgeoning size of the central plan inflates the requirement of the central government, leaving only a smaller portion, currently 32%, for all the states combined. In this sense, it actually even preempts mandate of the Finance Commission, which is limited by its implied non-plan mandate. Central schemes, by whatever names, have reduced the flow of untied funds to the state, even on the plan side. As against the 1969 NDC resolution requiring 70% of the funds to be untied as normal central assistance, currently only 10% of the funds are in this form. I would therefore request the Finance Commission to question the requirement of funds for the central plan, especially when such requirements are for subjects in the state list of the 7th schedule of the Constitution. The mandate of the Finance Commission should definitely be understood to also look at the so-called plan requirements of the central government. What is worse is that 90% central assistance, which comes in the form of central schemes, also completely preempts not only the 10% untied assistance, but also a considerable amount of state's own resources. For the year 2013-14, for example, the state share required to leverage flow of funds from the central schemes is nearly 5,000 crores. This, in fact, is seven times the untied central assistance of 700 crores, which in turn is an ignorable 1.5% of the total size of the state plan. Thus, if the state finances are being preempted, this is a constitutionally questionable practice because the decision of state assembly when they vote expenditure are being preempted by presenting both the government and the house with a Hobson's choice. This must be remedied. One remedy we have suggested is that the Finance Commission count these expenditures as state's expenditures needs and revise uh, as the state's expenditure needs and revise the share of states in central taxes to 50% and mandate that the expenditure under these schemes be undertaken by the states only. I have dwelt on how central schemes have encroached on and abridged the fiscal federalism envisaged in the constitution. In a two-part piece published in the Financial Express 2011 and I have circulated a copy of that with my written speech, and I know that you've all read it because we talked about it last night. Any major development which has already started assuming alarming proportions is the expenditure being mandated under the laws enacted by Parliament in the name of entitlements. There are several laws which now mandate expenditures. This tendency of the central government to mandate such entitlements as legally enforceable rights while acknowledging that central schemes are failing to deliver <coughs> services to the citizens are also based on the false assumption that government would work only if pushed or punished by the judiciary or quasi-judicial bodies. As some of you might be aware, 
my entire government, including ministers, has intensively toured the Bharatpur division for 10 days. It is horribly obvious that after 65 years of central schemes on the so-called national priorities, what, com what we have is a completely mangled setup, a school system where class 7 students do not know the tables of 9, the entire alphabet, either in Hindi or English, health centers that are such only in name, avas, yojanas, by whatever name, that do not certainly build a home for the so-called beneficiary. It is as clear as daylight that what we have been doing, the model and the methodology that we have been following, are just not right. And that doing more of the same thing in the same way is not going to help us. We have to change. We have to change the way we do things. Several or alternative models have to be considered and tested. The central theme of such models will have to be carefully crafted systems of measuring and incentivizing delivery and then penalizing non-performance. This can only be done by the states and certainly not as a part of any central scheme. As we have seen, Jaipur is far. In the last 10 days we saw this. The Jaipur is so far away then Delhi really is too far away. And I hope the FFC will incentivize alternative model methods of delivery, of service delivery, or infrastructure creation. This is the need of the hour. I want to emphasize, and this by the way is even clearer after this election, the people do not want tools. They do not want to be dependent upon the state. And they are not interested in freebies. They want development and through that employment. And I carry here with me something which, you know, I have used it in the elections, I've tried to bring it everywhere. It's very important and you need to know. This is from the Facebook. <coughs> People on the Facebook and how they have reacted to this. At the time when the freebies were being given out, and we're all on Facebook, so we saw on July the 21st, this is what one of them said. Muft me laptop lelo, muft me chawal lelo, muft me cycle lelo, muft me bijli tak bhi de rahe hain, lekin rozda nahi denge, aur nahi achhi sarkar denge. Desh ko bhikari bana kar, har haath me katora thama kar hi ban lenge. This is July 15th, July 21st, and then there is this, Vishal Sharma on August 15th. Free my laptop lelo, moft me chawal lelo, moft me cycle or scooty bhi lelo. Yaha tak ab to bijli bhi moft dene tak ki baat loo karne lagi hai. Aaj svatantata prakti ke din, desh vasiyo ke haat mein katora thama kar bhikari banaya jane ki baat ho rahi hai. Taaki ek baat phir is desh ki janta ko gulaam banaya ja sa. Not just us, I mean, I think it's very important that we start to understand what we could think about us and what we've been doing over the last 60 years. But I needed to just bring that to your attention. I think it's important. So I would raise one more issue. The issue of conditionalities attached to the grants. I have to say that sometimes even the Finance Commission gets tempted to attach condition to the grants. The 13th Finance Commission did. The government of India is always very liberal in imposing additional conditions. As a result, the number of grants remain undispersed. I think the basic purpose of a grant is therefore defeated if due to procedural and other factors, these grants do not reach the states. Some are, and these are some examples are, grants relating to water sector management, an incentive for issuing URDs recommended by the 13th Finance Commission. I would now like to draw the attention of the Commission towards the state of state of the state finances. During my last tenure when I took over, the finances of the state were in a really bad state. The, sh the state was mired in revenue deficit and overdraft was frequently resorted to. We took a number of innovative initiatives and brought the state to a very sound financial position. Now, when we have come back, we find that the state finances are once more under severe stress. 
The state has again slipped to revenue deficit, and our fiscal deficit this year is far in excess of 3% of GSDP. This is the result of the so-called populist schemes taken up by the previous government with an hour on the elections. Expectedly, the broken system that central schemes have helped in creating in the last six decades did not deliver on the promises made, and the results speak for themselves. While they did not achieve the electoral victory they were aiming for, they did manage to leave the state bleeding. We need to set things right in the coming years, and we hope that the recommendations of this Finance Commission will help us to do this. I would like to underline here that good governance, which can broadly be defined as a responsive administration that deliver, delivers basic services, is now central to politics in India. All state governments are not irresponsible. If state governments in Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh are being re-elected repeatedly, then politics in India is coming out of the shadows of caste and money. Most state governments are now responsible governments. They want to be re-elected on the back of good governance. Consequently, another conventional thinking, which sees the states as irresponsible or profligate, and this is special to central government officials, now needs to be thrown out of the window. We, the states, need to be treated with respect and as partners, not as recalcitrant children. As has been pointed out in the state government's memorandum, cess and surcharge on income tax and other central taxes are really a means of shortchanging the states. The irony is that some cess, like the education cess, is for funding an uncalled for central scheme on a state subject. Cesses and surcharges should certainly be counted as a part of the divisible pool. The Commission is well aware of the handicaps and bottlenecks which this state faces due to its size, its geophysical condition, and its historical legacy. The extra cost of delivery of services deserves the special attention of the Commission. The key priority of my government would be to increase investment, eradicate unemployment, and improve the economic structure, education, and skill development of the people of the state. We would have to deliver all public services while keeping a, a high standard. I'm not asking here for the moon, but only for what is rightfully ours and that which is within the federal system. Hence, I'm sure the Commission will strengthen our hands so that we may usher in good governance and ensure faster development while maintaining sound fiscal management in the state. This, in the long run, will only help India, will only help actually develop this country. So without the states, and without the development of the states, there is no way that the country can actually move forward. So with these words, I want to thank all the members of the Commission for having taken the pains to come here. And I do hope, in the time that you've been here, you have been comfortable. Rajasthan is known for its legendary hospitality. I hope that we have in no way let our standards down. Thank you very much. Also, non-renewable resources. Also, the point. You know, non-renewable resources. Uh, Mr. Manish just talked to you about the zinc part. Of it. Zinc uh, is a, a monopoly item by one very large firm that earns in billions, and we get nothing from it. And it's our non-renewable resource. And it's all done between the guys in central government and those persons there. It's really not very fair. I, I mean, I, I've said this many, many times the last, over the last so many years. I really think that is something that one has to look at. It cannot be something that can be arranged between two people sitting there at the center. It has to give back something to the state. 